when I think of Father's Day, um, I, I try to think of the good stuff. You know, the uh, I have a great father. I have a, a great example of what a dad should be. Uh, my dad is still living, and we still are very close. And Happy Father's Day, Dad. He'll be watching this later because he loves his children. He likes to watch everything they do. Uh, so in, in the States, he'll, he'll watch this later uh, today. But um, I'm so grateful for him and for who he is. But also, to be honest with you, I think about all the, the negative uh, pictures of, of what a father is. Uh, I think about um, a young man who's married, uh, who is about to be a father and is terrified. And he's terrified because he just found out that his father is actually his uncle uh, that is now married to his mother's sister. His adopted father and his real mother are alcoholics. Uh, he's been working since he was 16 to make sure that uh, his sister and his brother were fed. That's how he was raised. Um, and he has trouble now because he doesn't feel much. Uh, he feels a bit numb. And most of the time it isn't, he isn't sure how he's going to love his own kids when they come. He needed a father. Praise the Lord, though. He has met Abba Father, and God's loving him well. He's a bit nervous about what's coming. I think of another young man who is one of 12 children that he knows of. He has two siblings from his mother. Uh, his other siblings are from about five other women that his father has had moments with. Uh, he struggles with loving and accepting his own father. Every year he finds out uh, about some other sibling he never knew about. He needed a father. He needed a father, but he has met Abba Father, and God is loving him well. I, uh, the fact is, is that our world is a world that is fatherless on multiple levels. That's the reality of Father's Day. And maybe this morning, as you think about Father's Day, you think about that. Uh, where was my father? And about all the others that you know don't have fatherly examples, good examples. We need, all of us need two fathers. Uh, we need our physical fathers, and most importantly, we need our heavenly father. And the fact is, is that uh, we can really survive. As a matter of fact, we can soar. We can be amazing uh, without the love of a physical father if we have received the love of God the Father. We are more than likely, uh, we'll struggle on multiple levels in this life, though, if we haven't had, if we haven't made that relationship right, there seems to be in people who don't have a father's love, a, a fear of life, a lack of confidence, uh, and and for many an inability to su succeed at life. Now this is overcome only when an individual discovers the love of heavenly Father. So there's hope today. Uh, if you don't have a good example of a physical father, there's hope for you if you're willing to take that step to meet and to encounter Heavenly Father. God invites us uh, to become His child, and He invites us uh, to take the role of, of Him as our Father in our lives. You ask anyone who's still following Jesus, and they will say, I understand that my Father, God the Father, loves me. Uh, they will always go back to that. If there's struggle in their life, if there has been struggle in their life, but they're still following Jesus, they will say, no, I know that my Father loves me. He loves me, and next to that list, I still love Him, will be part of that conversation is the reason why I continue to follow Jesus. The Father's love is so essential in our lives. We, we desperately need it. Uh, we need that so desperately in our lives. How do you see God when you consider that relationship? Uh, do, you, do you have a relationship with Him? Uh, do you see Him as that potential Father that you've never had? Um, I love what A.W. Tozer says. What, what comes into our minds when we think about God is, is the most important thing about us. Uh, we need to, to settle that relationship with our Father. Now, it, it may be possible this morning as you consider uh, other relationships in your life, possibly the father relationship that you don't have here. Uh, that's an important consideration, and it's worthy of time for you to pursue and discover how that relationship could be more meaningful. But the most important uh, journey of your life needs to be that, that discovery of who God the Father is in your life. And if you can sort that one out, 
uh, that other pursuit of trying to figure out that relationship with your earthly father potentially uh, may never be solved, but at least in your own life, you can have resolution and you can have peace. It's possible that our relationships with our parents will continue to be dysfunctional until we die or until they die. But God invites us to have a healthy relationship with him that can solve all of those issues that we have here. Happy Father's Day. And may we this morning truly encounter the love of God the Father. I want us to look this morning at 1 John 3, 1 through 3. Because I believe uh, the Apostle John actually spoke deeply about this. And, and his life was measured and understood and successful because he knew that he was loved by God the Father. This is what he says. Reminding us, reminding the people he wrote to this. He says, see how very much our Father loves us. For he calls us his children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we'll be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. All who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. The writers of the New Testament John here is no exception, felt over time as they wrote, as they connected with people that uh, uh, they worked with, uh, the church, they needed to remind them on a regular basis that they were loved. And, and spoiler alert, um, if you've been with us uh, since the beginning of this year in sermons, we have been going through a series of reminding us that God loves us. Uh, that moved in after that into a series of helping us understand how we could then through the Father's love, love a lost world and love each other in, a, in an effective way. Uh, today, we're going to go back uh, and you're going to hear maybe some stuff you've heard already from me earlier this year in this sermon. So if you say, I think he's said that before, it's because I have. Uh, <laughs> so First John 3, see how very much our Father loves us for he calls us his children and that is what we are. I think... Uh, God asks us on occasion, do you know how much I love you? Just like we saw on the sketch earlier, Dad, you're going to tell me you love me. Have I told you lately how much I love you? <laughs> Have I told you? I think God over and over again reminds us of how much he loves us because we need to be told. We desperately need the Father's love. This passage uh, 1 John 3, 1 through 3, is especially intriguing to me because of, of who it's written to. Uh, this letter is written to people who had watched members of their own group leave the church because they had been seduced by the world. Somehow they had missed, understood, or not fully uh, received this incredible love of God the Father, and they made a decision based on their new understanding that they needed to leave the body of Christ and, and go into the world again. There's no evidence in this text that it was written to people who were being persecuted. It was just people written, written to people who were, who were still faithful uh, when others in their congregation had actually left. It's... I just lost my sermon on my iPad. And there it is again. I recently heard a, 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 a sermon of a guy who was telling everyone how grateful he was uh, when he saw a guy lose his iPad uh, in the middle of his wedding he was doing. He celebrated it because uh, he was so against iPads. And I think about him every time my iPad misfunctions. Uh, he's probably celebrating somewhere in Texas today. There we are. <clears throat> It's clear that false teachers against whom John was writing in this first letter denied the reality of the incarnation of Jesus in the physical body. Uh, every spirit, writes John, that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So you have this writing to people who were continuing to be faithful in the church, writing about people who had left the church uh, for, for different reasons. He's writing the children of God. We see this in 1 John 2. 
And, and I want to point this out to you here, 1 John 2, verse 14, who he's writing to very specifically. Uh, I have written to you who are who? God's children, because you know the Father. And you begin to see this, uh, what John is saying here, this understanding was that the, the, the key to the faithfulness, the, the key to resilience, the key to continuing to be faithful to love Jesus Christ uh, and, and stay in the church, uh, to be part of the church and part of the body, is this understanding that you are children of God and you are loved. Uh, very, very important. God's children, the church, needs to be reminded just how much God loves them. The love of God, so much that he calls us his children. Fellowship of God and the body of Christ characterized by joy. John here is saying that above everything else, the real key of knowing that God loves you is that he calls you his child. This is the love of God. He calls us his children. I think this morning of my son, uh, in Texas who just adopted twin girls. And every time I think about it, I continue to admire him. I just continue to be amazed that these two children now, these twins, uh, are being loved by someone who chose to love them. And that my son now is the father of these two girls. Uh, and these girls will be raised, in a, I know, in a home of under a father's love. And I, I praise God for that. So why did John write this? He uh, says this in 1 John 1, verse 3. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things to you that you may fully share our joy. He goes on in the letter of, the first, of 1 John to describe, he says, I'm writing this to you so you won't sin. I'm writing this to you so that uh, you will have assurance of eternal life. Uh, I'm also writing this to you so that you'll have the assurance of the foreverness of God, that uh, you're going to be with him forever. He says, come and see how very much our father loves us, for he calls us his children. And this speaks to our identity, right? Uh, 1 John 3, see how very much our father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. He speaks to our identity, who we are. This is very important, extremely important. God loves us. God's love for us speaks into into who we are. We're children of God, not children of the devil. This is huge, especially in a world that has embraced uh, a fluid identity narrative. Uh, our identity is totally different than our character, our behavior. Who we are is different than what we do and different than even our temptations. Our identity does greatly impact our behavior, right? We know that. But our identity is fixed in Christ, and therefore then our character is not who we are, but our character is then fluid. We live in a world today that very often has allowed our character to be used to identify who we are, rather than uh, our behavior. If we operate from the belief that we are messed up, are fundamentally flawed, uh, we're operating from what? From shame, right? Shame says, shame says, I am worth, I'm a worthless, terrible person. There's no hope for me. Shame says, this is who I am. I have no other choice than to believe this way. How do we deal with shame? We become someone new in Christ. As a child of God, I operate with hope, trusting that I am a new person, not flawed, becoming like Jesus more and more each day, becoming less and less like the flawed human being that does not belong to God, operating totally without his love and power. And this is where shame is different than guilt. I still sin, but my sin does not define who I am. Enter guilt. Guilt says that is what I have done, but it isn't who I am. How do we deal with guilt? We confess our sins to the advocate. We confess our sins. It's merely something I have done that I can be punished or forgiven for. In this sense, my character is fluid. I can change my behavior and become a better person. So my sin nature does not define who I am. And my identity is fixed and sure, and my hope is in the fact that I'm a child of God. So my identity comes into that uh, I see God as my father. And not just that I see it, but that I truly am. I truly am his child. He truly is my father. 
And therefore, the sin that I commit, the behavior, my character, uh, is a fluid issue. It, it doesn't define who I am. Authors of the Bible agree with this premise. Our identity changes when we receive God's gift of love. Look at Galatians 3. Galatians 3, verse 26 and through 29 says this. Paul says, for, for you are all, what? Children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put in Christ like putting on new clothes. There is, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of God. You are heirs and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. This goes on. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. I love this. It says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, some of you were what? Once like that. But you're cleansed, you're made holy, and you're made right with God by calling on the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So our sin no longer defines who we are. Our behavior no longer defines who we are. The, the, our behavior then becomes the evidence of who we are rather than uh, who we are. We are children of God. And, and, and because of that, we've been washed, we've been sanctified, we've been justified in the name of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. We've been changed. We are now as children with all the rights and privileges. We are heirs with a great inheritance. We have eternal life. We have abundant life. Uh, Peter says we, we are a royal priesthood. Uh, we have this incredible inheritance. That's who I am. My sin no longer defines who I am. It is Christ and Christ only who defines that. And then we live with great expectation. 1 Peter 2 says this, uh, verse 10, Once you had no identity as a people, but now you are who? You are God's people. And he goes on to say, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners. There, there's this understanding by the, those who walked with Jesus that once Jesus Christ uh, comes into our life, uh, the, the author said that when we place faith in him, uh, we become the home of Christ. Jesus makes his home within us. We become children of God. Everything changes, transforms. We become new people. That becomes who we are, and it impacts what we do. Here we are temporary residents and foreigners here, and, and that's how we should live. Rather than connecting to whatever behavior, whatever sin seems to define uh, our character, instead of identifying with that particular character, we identify as children of God. And we go, we go to God for that forgiveness and we, we trust the Lord for that transformation that, that is an ongoing process of our lives. Uh, to form a resilient identity, uh, to experience uh, this intimacy with Jesus Christ uh, is key and important to, to this life. It's, it's key and important to our success. I have to say, uh, I, I, ha I struggled uh, here uh, for a long time uh, in my faith. God's forgiveness, uh, I believed, was for everyone but me. Uh, I, I felt like that my sin was really who I was instead of being embraced by this love of God. This is what I believe. These are the few crazy things that I believed about myself. I believed I was a bad person, unredeemable. Uh, this belief was coupled with, uh, I am stupid, uh, I am ugly. I don't know what that was all about. Anyway. I am lazy. I'm disorganized. I'm dirty. There was no hope. And I forget the episode of my life that led to the conversation with my father. Uh, but I said, but all those lies were flying through my head. And dad didn't say a lot. He just listened. And then he gave me this passage, Isaiah 43, uh, verses 3 through 4. This is what he handed me. He wrote this down and handed it to me. We opened up the Bible and I read. And this is what God says about people who follow him. He says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. 
I give Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I give Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours because you are what? You're precious to me. You're honored and I love you. That's what dad gave me. I left his office and, and that, was the, that was the trigger for me to understand, wait a minute, separate of my behavior, I'm loved by God the Father. I began a journey. I was about 17 when I had this conversation with my dad, and this started this process of me discovering, wait a minute, uh, I'm actually loved, separate of my behavior. Uh, Paul wrote about this extensively in the book of Romans. He says, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. So we are loved by the Father, not because of our behavior, but because of who he is. And the beauty of the cross is that Christ dies and he invites us to become his children, not because we're worthy of it, but because his love is so extraordinary. We need to be convinced. We need to understand that God obsessively loves his creation. And he invites us to be forgiven, to be transformed, to become one of his children. The Father invites us. Loving Father. It's possible this morning because of your perception of your earthly father and potentially then your perception of God the Father, you are unable to accept the idea or the thought of a loving father. God invites you in so many different ways all through scripture that he loves us. He says, I love you. Come, let me forgive you. Let me transform your life. My journey uh, was understanding that God loved me separate of my behavior. Look at, look at 1 John 3, 19-20. This is a huge passage in my life. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before Him. For whenever our hearts condemn us, what? God is greater than our heart and He knows everything. There was this aha moment in my life finally when I realized that God loved me separate. I, I could not control the Father's love for me. That God was completely, totally in control of how much He loved me. And there's nothing I could do to impact His love for me and His love for anyone else. I was not powerful enough, big enough to change God's compassion for me. That's in God's hands, not mine. God is in control of how He loves. I am not. 1 John 4, 9-10 through 10 also, God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, right? But that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. So what's the application for you and for me? For me, it was huge implications. God loves me not because of the way I look. Let me list a few things that have no impact on God's love. This, the color of my skin does not determine God's love. So people, all of us in here, beautiful colors that sit in this room, all of us are equally loved by God. Whether you think so or not, <laughs> you are desperately loved by God the Father. Doesn't matter what language you speak, doesn't matter where you came, doesn't matter where you were born, doesn't matter what your situation is, God loves you. Your cultural background cannot impact also God's love for you cultural history of my ancestors, whatever cultural paradigm that I, that I feel like I'm parked in, culture has no control over God's love for you. And very often we make the mistake of raising culture much higher and, and we culture has a much more powerful place in our life and our identity is connected so strongly to our culture instead of the love of God. God invites us and invites us to this relationship that is stronger, more powerful than our culture. God's love is more powerful than my gender. In Christ, there is no male or female, Paul says. However you identify currently, identify in Christ. God is more powerful than my sexual preferences. God is more powerful than my education. God is more powerful than my position or influence and power. And praise the Lord, God is more powerful than my weaknesses, than my sins and my failures. God 
loves us, and he invites us to become his children. Not because we deserve it, because he's loving. We become, in Christ, a new identity, right? We become children of God. I would encourage you just to, just to shout out, see if you can do this. If someone asks you who you are, instead of saying, I'm a man, <laughs> or, or I'm a nurse, or I'm a woman, uh, I'm a lawyer, whatever you like to identify yourself, why, why not say, I'm a child of God? I'm a child of God. Let that be your fixed identity. Everything else, let that be fluid. Our character is now fluid and changeable because of our new fixed identity in Christ. You know what? I'm redeemable. Not because of me. I'm smart. I'm beautiful. I'm respected. This world is not the end all. I live with hope of being made like Jesus someday. How do I live with a fixed identity in Christ? And John addresses this too in the passage. Uh, we become more and more like him day by day. Perfected, perfecting our love for him and for others. We live with this eager expectation. And this eager expectation produces a life of purity where we become more and more like him, less and less like this world. First John 3 says this, 1 John 3, 3, and all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. Now, the fact is, is that I will still sin, right? In this new identity, but it's no longer who I am. It's, it's what I do. It's my behavior. And God is continuing to change that. And John was aware of this, the reality that we continue to sin. He wrote about this extensively. 1 John 1, uh, verse 8. If we claim we have no sin, Right? We're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. You know, John who writes, we are children of God and God loves us, says, if you say you have no sin, <laughs> you're lying. You're fooling yourself. You're not living in the truth. But we can, if we confess our sins, he's what? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our, all our wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his world, his word has no place in our hearts. My dear children, 1 John 2 says this, I'm writing this to you so that you will what? I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. 1 John 2 verses 1 and following. But if anyone does sin, I love that. I'm writing this so that you won't sin, but when you do, <laughs> it's what he's saying. It's the reality that yes, as children of God, we are going to sin because we're becoming. We're not yet. Uh, 1 John 3 says that we are going to see him face to face. When we see him face to face, we're going to what? Become like him. We're not like him yet, but we are his children, 100% his children. So John says, instead of pushing yourself into this whole world of shame, admit that your guilt, confess your sins, and bring that to the Father and let him deal with it. That's the love of God that he continues to deal with your sin. Continue to make you right. Not that you're not going to sin. It says, when you sin, come to the Father. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. John wrote from the perspective of love. John wrote knowing that he was loved by the Father. I want you to see this in 1 John 4. He says this, 1 John 4, 16. We know how, how much, we know how much God loves us. And we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. As, and as we live in God, our, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. The success of John really was that he understood completely that he's a child of God and he was loved by God. You see this, <laughs> stories written about John while he was walking with Jesus. Uh, he would introduce himself as the one that, that Jesus loved. Uh, <laughs> he knew he was loved. He's writing this letter now uh, decades after uh, Jesus actually ascended and he's still, still aware 
of the extraordinary love of God and still following Jesus. The, the, the actual book of John was written by this same man who, who speaks so loudly and so boldly about uh, the truth of who God is. Matter of fact, the whole book of John is written to illustrate uh, uh, the, the, the power and the reality of the existence of God so that people would believe and place faith in him. Here he is, an old man, still walking faithfully and knowing that he's loved by God the Father. And that's his resilience. That's his consistent faithfulness to God because of that. Where are you? Where am I? Uh, are we aware of how much the Father loves us? Are we aware of, of, of the gospel that says, uh, in spite of your sin, we're loved? When we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. And he continues to cleanse us and to, and to bring us more and more like him. Our Father loves us. And I hope more than anything else today that you'll understand that Father in heaven is absolutely crazy about you. When he's written about, so many different ways he's described. But like a, uh, he's described as the one who, who has your name written in the palm of his hand. Uh, he's described as, as someone like a mother who loves their child, but he, he, loves, he loves children more than a mother loves their own child. Incredible. Uh, just so many different ways that, that God is described. In one, this is very important to be very special to me, he says that he knows the number of hairs we have on our head. Uh, this is that obsessive love, the detailed love of God for his children. Uh, my, I, I haven't counted the hair on my head. It's, it's, it's easier to count. I just haven't done it. Uh, but, but God absolutely loves and knows exactly every detail. of. That's how interested he is in me. And, and you as well. For you who have a lot of hair, God, God is obsessive about you. Uh, we see in Zephaniah 3.17 uh, that, that God sings over his children. He sings over us, sings over his creation. He's delighted with us. So that's, that's the father that I want you to, to meet today. That's the father that I want you to understand exists and is offering you an invitation to come and to know him, to experience. Who are you this morning? I hope you're a child of God. That's my hope. What's true about you? So many things. But this one, undeniable, you are deeply loved by God. That's a fact. And there's nothing you can do about it except say yes. What is a lie about you? So many different things. And this morning I invite you to consider what's true, what's not. But don't miss that you are deeply loved by God. What would convince you that God loves you this morning? What would that be? Jesus gave his only son to die on your behalf so that you could become his. Maybe that's enough for you this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We thank you. Lord, thank you that you love us. Lord, with a love that is beyond our, even our understanding. So Lord, we just say yes. We thank you. We receive God because we know this has nothing to do with us, Father, but you just love us. Lord, we give you praise. We give you honor this morning. In your name I pray. Amen.